There is also um, the respiratory illnesses that come from these factory farms, from the lagoons, from the barns, as I mentioned. Um, then there's the risk from the food itself. And one of the biggest ones is MRSA, multi-resistant staph. I don't know the Latin name of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a staph infection. You've probably heard of MRSA. Uh, generally, it's been considered to develop in hospitals. Any place where there's large amounts of antibiotic use, uh, you get this resistant bacteria that's resistant to many different types of antibiotics. Uh, and we're starting to see more and more MRSA in these farming communities where people are infected either through breathing the air or possibly drinking the water. But there's also MRSA in the meat that you bring home, particularly pork. And if it's not handled properly, you're, you're literally bringing in a very dangerous disease into your home because these farms are so reliant on antibiotics just to keep these animals alive. Um, the, with that concentration, with that C word, you have such large amounts of pathogens concentrated in such a small area that the animals get sick. And the only way to prevent them from getting sick is to load them up with antibiotics. They will even use antibiotics prophylactically. Even if the animals aren't sick, they'll put the antibiotics in the feed to prevent disease um, spread. It's also believed that some of these antibiotics do make the animals grow faster, just like the arsenic in chicken. But this over-reliance, I mean, I went to, to feed stores where the, the, the antibiotics are sold, you know, like sand. There's giant piles of it, and farmers would buy hundreds and hundreds of pounds of the antibiotic and then mix it into the feed to give to the animals. And of course, pathogens have a way of mutating and getting around the impact, uh, the, the, the viability of that antibiotic, and then it becomes resistant. And if they do it to three or four or five different types of antibiotics, it becomes multi-drug resistant, and it's still a very serious problem. Um, there is also the issue of salmonella. And I don't know if you remember back in, it was probably 2007, I want to say, there was a huge outbreak of salmonella in eggs. And half a billion eggs were recalled. And people were getting sick. I, I spoke to people who got sick from that salmonella outbreak. Salmonella is a very serious disease. And the reason that it happened was, if, if you know how a typical factory farm uh, egg laying operation is, these chickens are kept in these tiny little cages. Um, they can barely turn around in them. Sometimes there's two or three or more chickens in that cage. And they have two conveyor belts, one to bring feed in and one to bring the eggs out. And the waste, just, it just drops. And sometimes it drops to the, these cages are stacked up on top of each other. And the waste will just fall and fall and fall. And if one chicken becomes infected with salmonella, virtually all of them will. And that's what happened in these outbreaks. These places are so filthy, and they don't have proper aeration, and they are just uh, growing beds, if you will, for disease. And that's how we got this huge salmonella outbreak. Another thing that you don't hear about very much anymore, but it's out there, is mad cow disease. And we only test about one in 10,000 cows for mad cow disease. And that leaves open for chance a lot of problems. And we don't even report it anymore when there is a, a, a cow um, discovered with uh, what's called BSC, bovine sponge, spongiform encephalopathy. Sorry, it's been a little while since I've <clears throat> talked about this subject. Um, and there was an outbreak in Washington State when I was writing this book. And it was a cow that was brought in. It could barely walk to the slaughterhouse. It was obviously diseased. And they went ahead and slaughtered it anyway. And they sold the meat. And these, it was a dairy cow. For most of the mad cow cases are dairy cattle. And I don't know if you know this, but when you're done with the dairy cattle, it goes to the slaughterhouse, and it gets ground up, and it gets turned into hamburger. Most of the hamburger you buy in the store unless it's Angus beef or grass-fed beef, is, I'm sorry to say it, a, a used up, dried up dairy cow. And they grind it up into huge, massive batches 
So when you buy hamburger, you're not just eating one cow. You're eating several cows. Uh, and if there is these prions, these, these split proteins that cause mad cow disease, uh, in that meat, it will contaminate the whole batch. Well, this meat was sent out. It was only later they discovered that that cow had this disease. And again, we're only testing one in 10,000 animals. Um, cows get this disease by eating beef, by, by eating food that contains beef byproducts. And that is technically illegal in this country, but there are three ways that we actually do still feed beef products to cattle. Uh, one is at these mega dairies. And because the cow's milk is the commodity, when a calf is born, it's taken away immediately from its mother. Never gets a chance to drink its own mother's milk. And I've seen this. And they're given formula. And part of that formula contains blood products from cattle. So here we are feeding a cattle product to a calf. That's one way. The second way is restaurant scraps. There's very few regulations about this. A lot of restaurants will sell their leftover food, especially uh, cafeteria, uh, school dorms, prisons, anywhere where there's large amounts of food that needs to be uh, disposed of, that goes into cattle feed. And of course, if there was beef on the menu that day, that goes into the feed. And these cows are then eating cattle byproducts. And the third way is, is the most disgusting. I mentioned the, the chicken litter and how they produce so much that there's, there's too much of it for the land to absorb. Um, you can't spread it. If you let it pile up, it runs off into places like Chesapeake Bay. So in some parts of the country, they've actually opened up chicken operations near cattle feeding operations. And they feed that litter to the cows. Um, which is gross in and of itself. But what happens is they put beef byproducts into chicken feed often. And when they feed the chickens, you know, they're pretty sloppy eaters. So they, they, they spill their feed into the litter. So now you have beef byproducts in the litter, which is then fed back to cows. And people have been trying to get the FDA and the USDA to, to stop this practice for years. Um, and as far as I know, it's still going on. So it's the, the, the risk, and, and we see cases of BSE come up quite a bit, and usually they're classified as wild type. Um, and and it's, it's hard to imagine how you could get a wild type form of BSE, unless maybe if you're out shooting elk or deer, which can also carry this disease. But um, it's, it's, it's a threat, it's a risk, and it's really not being addressed or talked about very much in the country. Then there are all the heavy metals that are present in, in, um, in our meat supply. Uh, I mentioned arsenic and there are, now fortunately most of the big companies have stopped putting arsenic into the chicken feed, although some still do. Some pork growers use the same product in their feed. Um, but they also use things like copper. Uh, copper can help prevent intestinal diseases and things like that. Well, there was a shipload of American beef that was being exported to Mexico. And it got to the border, and they tested it for copper, and the levels were way above any safety standard um, that the Mexicans had. Well, we don't set safety standards for copper in our beef. And that shipload was turned around and sent back to the United States. There was too much copper in the beef for the Mexicans to accept it, so it was then sent back and sold to Americans. Uh, and copper is, is, is a heavy metal. Uh, too much copper can, can be very damaging. Uh, there's also a lot of mercury involved in these operations. A lot of places use fish meal in their feed. Uh, I remember when I lived in South Africa when I was a kid, I went there as an exchange student, and they almost exclusively fed their poultry and pork uh, fish meal. So you <laughs> would get a piece of bacon, and it would taste like fish. It was really kind of not very good. Um, and we feed a lot of uh, fish meal to poultry, particularly turkeys. And in, for example, Minnesota, it's now against the law to incinerate turkey litter because it is so highly contaminated with mercury. So you're getting pathogens, 
you're getting prions, you're getting heavy metals in the food that you bring home from the supermarket. And I do believe this is having a big impact on, um, on our health, uh, in addition to, to MRSA, as I mentioned. Um, and then there are the antibiotics, and there are residual antibiotics in our food. Um, the Japanese, if you're a, a hog farmer and you want to export to Japan, you have to wean your animals off antibiotics two months before you send them to slaughter, or Japan will not accept that as an import item. Well, domestically marketed pork, they keep them on antibiotics almost up to the day that they're killed. So what do the Japanese know that we don't know or that we're not being told? What do the Mexicans know that we don't know or we're not being told? Um, these are health hazards, and they mean our food supply can harm us. And the federal government's doing very, very little to um, control it. There is also the question of um, what's called bovine growth hormone, which is given to dairy cattle so that they produce uh, a lot more milk uh, at, at a time. Uh, cows treated with this hormone tend to live uh, much shorter lives. They produce more milk, but they go to the slaughterhouse earlier. Um, and they are something like 70% more likely to have serious infections of their udders. Um, it's not clear if that affects the milk because the milk gets pasteurized, of course. But it does mean that those cattle then require even more antibiotics to keep them healthy. And there's still a lot of controversy about BGH in milk. Uh, the FDA says it's perfectly safe. They say there's absolutely no difference between milk from non-GBH um, cattle and cattle that have been fed this hormone. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's true. Uh, this product has been banned in the European Union. It's banned in Canada. It's banned in most major industrialized countries. But we still use it to a large extent. I don't know exactly what percentage of dairy cows are given this hormone, but it's pretty widespread. And I went to a lot of factory farms where they use it. Uh, one concern is that it might uh, cause premature puberty, particularly in girls. Uh, another concern is links to certain types of cancer. There's a, uh, a substance in there called IGF-1, uh, which um, is highly elevated in milk from cattle treated with this, this product. And there are some scientific studies out there uh, linking, suggesting a link between IGF-1 and certain types of cancer, bladder cancer, I believe uterine cancer. Um, and it's not necessary. It's only for profit. Again, this feeding operation, the whole idea is to get the animal from birth, fed, fattened, and to market as quickly as possible, or its milk as quickly as possible. It's not necessary. Other countries don't use this product, and we're still using it. And of course, because of labeling laws, you don't know when you buy milk whether it was raised with this product or not, unless you buy organic milk, which is what I do, um, because it's pasture raised and they're not given these types of uh, antibiotics unless necessary. Now if an animal gets sick, you need to give it an antibiotic. But to give it growth hormone just so it will produce more milk in a shorter amount of time so that you make more profit, but what is the ultimate impact on human health in this country?